Thank you for coming to this Whole Youth Speaker Series event. <coughs> Dr. Pepper Schwartz has been at the University of Washington since 1972. In that time, she's become one of the country's leading experts on relationships. She's been everywhere from Oprah to Good Morning America. So we really want to thank her for taking time out of her busy schedule to share her research with the University of Washington community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pepper Schwartz. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for coming. I know that some of you from disparate parts of the uh, campus and had to kind of drag over here, so I appreciate it. And it's such a pretty day. I think like maybe some people get lost along the way. I might. Anyhow, I'm sort of a symbol of be careful where you take your first job. <laughs> because <laughs> here I am um, and happy to do it. It's, it's unusual to do a whole academic career in one place, but uh, this area and this university certainly uh, deserve it, so I'm lucky in all that. I'm um, kind of a maverick academic in the sense that while I write for all the serious journals and publish academic books, I also publish popular books and and write for uh, the general public. It's always been part of my academic ambitions to write things for the widest possible audience because I think it's important that research gets translated to people who can use it, not just people who can write more about it. So this particular study that I'm going to talk to you about today has been published in this um, format for a trade book, but the, but the academic work that went into it is, is serious. And basically, it was uh, actually not my idea, this particular research, but the idea was that, well, relationships are the core, the backbone, or the shifting sands of people's lives, depending on how they're going. And it's often good to see models of what works for people, and then see what else it can teach us to try and put in our own relationships. This study was a cyber study because we wanted to do an international comparison. So we did five sites in, the, in America. Um, I think Reader's Digest um, and AARP and some several younger women's and men's site, men's journal, things like that, to try and get a very diverse group of places to mount these, AOL.com. And then we wanted to do the same in other countries, but we couldn't get the same kind of internet reach that way, so we did random samples with, with um, survey organizations in about 10 countries. They're listed at the bottom of this slide, and we translated uh, the questionnaire into the native language of those countries. So uh, they were in Hungarian, Mandarin, Chinese, French, Spanish, German, etc. We also did a kind of innovative research model, and that is to say, we asked this instead of one long, endlessly long survey, which I don't know about you, but I get a really long survey, and by the end of it, I'm checking anything. Um, so we tried to say, well, I'd rather have people incomplete than cavalier about what they put in. So we, we did this online, in fact, I think you can still use it if you're interested, uh, to do it in pods, pods about money and pods about affection, pods about trust, pods about housework, pods about sex, whatever. So people could do the 12 to 15 questions of a pod, and then if they, if they finished it, we rewarded them with a cartoon. <laughs> So, you know, we're trying as much as we could to get people motivated but not overwhelmed. And so if you want to go, you could probably go to the normalbar.com and see what we did. So why did we put normal? Part of it was, oh, people are always saying, am I normal? And even though we don't like that, because relationships aren't like 98.6, there's no specific score. I could say, well, that's normal. And average doesn't mean anything good or bad. It's just what people do. So we just normal was, what do you do normally? What is your day like? How do you solve these issues? And ask people to sort of give us their everydayness in these areas. So for this lecture, um, I'm going to really talk about just the stuff on affection, love, romance, sex, 
just a whole sort of series of four pods and not everything else we found. And we were really looking at what were happy people likely to do. But we all have a tendency to say we're happy, so we made a very long Likert, Likert scale of this that went from extremely unhappy, call your doctor, you know, extremely unhappy, to extremely happy. So you could also choose happy, very happy, or extremely happy. We figured the people who said extremely happy were extremely happy, um, as opposed to just sort of happy. So we wanted to know people who were just about levitating with happiness, what happened for them. And of course, our study and every other study finds that with people who are extremely happy, they tend to be extremely happy about their relationship. That's a finding that goes across lots and lots of studies. But we thought found some things that we thought were not so important. They might, some of them might be like, oh yeah, except when we measure them, and maybe you can think about what I'm saying as I go, we find that a lot of these things that are really impo important for happiness uh, tend to get extinguished over time in relationships taken for granted. They were all there on hello and I love you. 30 years later, not so much. So we'll talk about that. So we took a look at uh, the smile of recognition out there. Yes, we're all guilty. Um, so we looked at some key behaviors, the ones that are up there, hand-holding, public displays of affection, spontaneous kissing. Spontaneous kissing is something that is done not during lovemaking. Um, cuddling and pet names. Um, and what we found was in our extremely happy couples, these were very common behaviors. 88% um, of our happiest couples said, I love you daily. Um, three quarters of them gave back rubs. I have to say the guys got a few more than the women did, but they were high <laughs> for extremely happy couples. Cuddling was very common at least two times a week, because you'll notice there was a difference between people who had kids and people who did not. I think that sometimes that's A, because they're busy, C, B, because they're tired, and C, because they're cuddling those kids, and they don't need cuddles from each other as much. And pet names, three quarters of our happiest couples gave each other pet names, like babe, honey, sweetie, you know, things like that. Not, you know, Rover, I mean, just, you know, <laughs> just names that were, affectionate and informal. Um, but what I thought was kind of interesting, we asked the people who didn't have a pet name if they would enjoy being given a pet name, like babe, sweetheart, etc., by their partner. And 50% of the people who didn't get them said they'd like them. So that's obviously an affectionate behavior that people actually would want to get. Public displays of affection. If you look at the statistic there, it shows you that while well, almost two-thirds did occasionally, at least occasionally, 40% in the United States said never or rarely. The U.S. is really not too keen on public displays of affection. What do we say when we see people embracing in public? Get a room. <laughs> well, <laughs> that does extinguish a certain amount of behavior right there. So that only 13% of our whole sample, the not, all the, the run from not happy to, to very, extremely happy, only 13% of the sample uh, in general said they, it, said they embraced or kissed in public at least once a week. But if you look at the European countries um, and Latin America, it's a lot more common. Um, here, for a second, it's a lot more common. And I should just say, in general, one of the things just to forecast my whole lecture here is that, you know, if you really want you know, an affection, a close, physically intimate study. It would be good if you were Hispanic. Um, if you can't be Hispanic, see if you can be French or Italian, or at least go and live there. So they, they're, they're way high on all of these measures. Spontaneous kissing, and I said kissing that isn't done in a sexual context, but more affectionate. Um, that's not common almost anywhere, but at least more than half of our extremely happy couples did it at least a few times a week. If we looked in our general sample, that's everyone, only about a third of the men said that they have spontaneous kissing in their relationship. That means two-thirds of American men do not. And a quarter of the men, which is a lot of people, there was about 100,000 people in the study, said that um, they never have kissing outside of a sexual circumstance. 
Who does the most passionate kissing? Well, what do you think? <laughs> Those Italians, the Spanish, the South, of Afri South Americans, they're much more likely to be expressive physically. Compliments. And it gets interesting here, I think. 39% um, of the men, only a quarter of the women, said their partner hardly or ever praises their appearance. Hardly or never, excuse me, praises their appearance. Um, so that's a lot of people who don't get you know, gee, you look great today, or I like that way that looks on you. Um, and in the romance category, here's sort of one of my take-home things that I want you to think about. That, in general, when you notice that uh, more men were complaining about compliments, well, more men complain about lack of romance, period, throughout this study. Um, the men would like more romance, and we always talk about how romantic women are. Well, they're seem to be getting more of that romance fulfilled from men than vice versa. We asked if you really felt deprived of romance. 30% of the women said, yes, I do. And 60% of the men said, yes, I do. And when we asked if, um, um, well, let me make one more point there. So that's a lot of men who are going around a little starved for romance. Um, but that male-female difference is not true in all of our countries. So, for example, in China, it's exactly reversed, basically. Um, you know, almost somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of the women in China um, who answered this said that they were starved for romance. Um, and the men's ratio is high, too, but significantly lower than the women's. And it really varied by country. Um, you could see that there's a lot of people who would like more romance, but it's lower in France and Italy and Spain. Spain was the lowest number of men who felt deprived. Um, and it's, um, it's a sort of an interesting thing where, in general, a lot of people would like more romance, but least deprived, again, the romance countries. Makes sense, right? So the question is, how big a deal is this? Is this just something everyone like? Would I would like more ice cream, right? You know, I could never quite get enough, but it's not really bothering my life. But when we ask them in the United States who's really bothered by this, you know, we wanted to know if it was a big problem for some people. You know, about a third of the women, a little less, well, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the women said they were really bothered. They really felt they weren't getting enough romance. But you have almost half the guys saying they're really bothered. So it seems to me that a lot of relationships have taken romance out of the equation too much, and it becomes important. Happy, of the happiest couples um, are, as I mentioned, they're saying, I love you. Um, excuse me, not half, you know, almost um, 80, between 80, 85% of the happiest couples are saying, someone's saying, I love you all the time. But men are far more likely to tell women, I love you, all the time than vice versa. That's a big difference when we ask, you know, if you do this at least once a week. Almost all the men said, I do, and slightly more than half of the women, but not slightly, significantly over half of the women said, I do. These gender differences go right through all the affectionate and romantic behaviors. Maybe women talk about meaning more, you know, or maybe we. We orient the, the films and the books, et cetera, to women, and maybe we're doing a great job. They're getting lots of romantic feeding, uh, men not so much. So what might inhibit romance and affection in these relationships? Um, this was an interesting one. We asked, um, do your spouse make, uh, uh, does, she, does she or he really make an effort to look nice for you? Um, and, um, that's a problem. 43% <laughs> of people said no. Um, and a third of them said they wish they would make more of an effort. And I should tell you that in the happiest couples, um, they, um, they say their partner makes an effort. We didn't ask even if they succeeded. We just said make an effort. <laughs> so I don't even want to know what that would be. Um, what about romantic getaways? I actually, um, one of the fun things I've done this year is write a book on rom romantic vacations because I think it's so important for people to break everyday life, get away. I don't care if it's, you know, two hours 
from here to uh, Leavenworth or whatever, but someplace where people are actually getting rid of the things that distract them and inhibit romance. It's a book called, uh, it's a Fromer's book, Places for Passion, The 75 Most Romantic Destinations in the World. And darn, I just had to go see them all. <laughs> so uh, that was a little self-serving, but I also, <laughs> hey, you gotta figure out how to do these things, right? You know, I'm willing to write a book. I, you, you can't imagine how much of my life is in my books. I wrote this book about uh, 200 questions to ask your parents and 200 questions to ask your kids because I had this truculent little preteen daughter who wouldn't talk to me. So I figured up a game and wrote the book for it and it worked, you know? So uh, this one was not about romantic vacations because I think they are so important, I do. And um, they're almost universal in our happiest couples, they take them. Um, but in our general population in the United States, it's interesting how few people go away for a vacation that is primarily about romance. People often take family vacations, um, but if you say, you know, did you take a vacation that was designed for romance for the two of you, only about a quarter of our whole sample did so. Um, and it's very much more common in France, in Italy, in Spain. It's like a broken record when I talk about those countries. What's interesting, the exception on the romantic vacation, this study looked at both same and opposite sex couples. The gay males were, were champs at this. They were out, and it could be that they had more discretionary income and less likely to have children, uh, but they were much more likely to take these kinds of vacations. Romantic gifts, 52% uh, of women said they don't get them. But many fewer women in France and Italy said that they don't get them. Most of those women do. But a much higher number of men said they don't get a uh, romantic vacation. Uh, excuse me, more romantic, don't get a romantic gift. Um, and you can contrast that to like 23% of men said they don't. So in other words, three-fourths of men said, of course I get romantic gifts and maybe only a third or so of men said they do. One man, we, you could take these things and also write in, in various kinds of explanations. He said, it depends if you consider a waffle iron a romantic gift. <laughs> I did not. Everybody also talks about communication. Um, and communication is one of those big black boxes with lots of in, interesting things to discuss within it. Um, but, um, the question is, how do they talk about things that are intimate that might help create a, a bigger, better connection between, between partners? And uh, most people said their communication about sex, anything about sex was pretty, pretty basic or absent. Um, same sex couples, again, felt they were better at this. Maybe having someone of the same sex as you allows a more easy uh, language, uh, easier to talk about what's going on, but nonetheless, it was much different. Um, and um, we thought there were some interesting kinds of gaps here. In our couples, um, more than half or about half of the men said they felt that their wife was having sex because she had to or because it was, you know, she felt that was part of her role and that that was her prime motivation, which, you know, of course isn't too flattering. Um, but was interesting when we looked at some paired responses of husbands and wives, not as many wives said they did that as husbands thought they did that. 37% against 53%. So that's quite a few men who are um, either mistaking their, women, their wives' motivations or women who are doing this in such a way that it might be easy to mistake their, their uh, motivations. Um, what you do see is in our extremely happy couples, that wasn't common. That statement was not common for men. What percent lie about their partner's sexual performance? 43% um, of the men, uh, women did it, and the older they got, the more they lied. <laughs> There's an interesting thing we could discuss there. Um, but many, many fewer men lied about their women's, their wife's performance, you know, and saying, and we think, we don't know if they were just, um, you know, not so good is still great, um, or that, you know, th that it's just women have higher expectations of what men should do, or 
fair enough that women have a much more complicated sexual system and it's harder for men to read it. One of my favorite jokes was one that went around the internet, I don't know how many years ago, but I, I snapped it up and put it in a lecture. And it has a picture of, it says, you know, sort of men's sexual way, men's sexuality. Um, and there was just a little switch, you know, sort of on, off, you know. And then that said women's sexuality and it looked like a picture of a cockpit. <laughs> you know, little buttons and things to press and signals that went off, et cetera. So it may well be that, you know, female sexuality is a little bit more difficult to do for somebody and that one of the reasons women um, didn't say everything that was on their mind was because he had not learned how to fly yet. I mean, he just couldn't <laughs> figure this out. Um, so communication might help. You know, that knob over there is the one you want. Um, or tonight, it's different. It's that knob. But. So here was an interesting question. And this, this was both about sex and it's also about other things. We asked people if they had major secrets from their partner. We did major and minor. Major is something like, I mean, we, and if it was, we asked them, these were anonymous questionnaires and they were on the internet, et cetera. But we asked them, what's your major secret? They were really major, like, my wife thinks I have a college degree and I don't. Or I had a, same, I had a lesbian relationship for four years and my husband doesn't know. Or my wife thinks we're financially solvent and we are not. I mean, big, big secrets, okay? Secrets that somebody else might feel they should know. 43% of the men and 33% of these women in the study said, I have that kind of secret, which is somewhat startling, I think. Um, but, um, and that was true, even a quarter of our happiest couples said they had that kind of secret. What was interesting to me, this just made me laugh for quite a long time, actually kind of blew me away, is 75% of the couples in Italy and France said they had major secrets, and what's it to you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were like, no, I mean, people would really write there. And I do read French, so um, the, the, I, they were saying like, you know, you Americans, you just blab, 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 you know, we, it's my business, it's her business, we start from here. She doesn't need to know, he doesn't need to know. I mean, really like telling us off, what is your problem? <laughs> so here in America, we go like, I don't know, and I found out, and I don't know if I can ever feel the same, and they're going like, I don't want to know, and et cetera. And these aren't on little ones. Like the little ones, like people um, would do like, the little ones, almost everybody had a secret. I don't think there's a man in America who knows what a dress really costs. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, that's just one of those things. It's creative pricing. Um, and there, there's just, and people have these little stashes of things that they do that, you know, they feel it's, you know, petty larceny as opposed to anything major. So, okay, on the general look at happiness and, and sex, uh, what about sexual frequency? Um, you know, if, and, Intuitively, you would think if people are pretty unhappy, they're not having sex very much, and that's true. Three quarters of people who are really unhappy don't have sex. I always think about what are those other 25% doing? You know, but obviously they can just have sex without any um, good relationship going on there, but they may be connected that way in some way. Um, the um, Italians, French, Spanish, they have higher frequencies. Everybody has found in a lot of studies that sexual frequency and sexual satisfaction are highly correlated the younger people are. And they're still correlated, but not as much as people get into middle and late age or, and more later ages. But they have a, they have a relationship. Um, when we asked people what they would like more of, it was really interesting. So men want sexual variety. They want less passivity, and I love this one. This came out of nowhere. They want to hear how they're doing. <laughs> you know, they really want noises. So if you really want to, if you're a woman you, or a man and you've got a male partner, at least grunt. You know, let, it, let, it, you know, let them know that that was good. There's a lot of complaints about that. Um, with women, um, as you might guess, they wanted uh, more uh, warm-up exercises. Um, 
Uh, there is a great uh, quote uh, by a psychologist many, many years ago who, who made this. I don't know if it was his or he got it from someone, but he said the reason that a lot of women fake orgasm is that most men fake foreplay. <laughs> so there was some sense of deprivation there. They said they wanted more romance. But interestingly enough, in different kinds of words, everyone said, could we just have something a little less expected, some, some lack of predictability. And I think it does happen. What um, everybody's, we're, we're a habit-forming creature. So if we found something worked, you know, we do it again the same way. And about 40 years later, somebody would like a break. So um, <laughs> a, little bit of, a little bit of change would, would, be, um, would be better. Um, here's one that I thought was really interesting. Um, how would you rate your partner's kissing on a 1 to 10 scale? Kissing is something that even if sex isn't too important, you most people want to connect with their spouse kissing. It's, a, it's that affectionate way you kiss in a special way to the person you're in love with or married to or, or dating, et cetera, um, that's different from friendship. And um, it was interesting in the United States, only a third of the women and a little over half of the men gave their partner a score b between 9 and 10, 9 and 10. Um, and I just thought that was it's higher um, in the Latin American and other countries. But it's still not. I should think that could be 80%, you know? Um, and I think it would be interesting to me why people couldn't say, hey, I would like to kiss this way or that way, or let's practice with this, or let's play with that. And I think people are just so frightened, no matter if it's their partner of 20 or 30 years, to say, let's, let's rethink this. Let's have some fun and try some new styles. Um, and so they go to the next 60 years, you know, rating their kissing, their partner's kissing is five. I say, you know, think about that. You know, all you have to do is say, let's, let's get experimental and try new ways of kissing. You don't have to say, I've been kissing you and hated it for 50 years. <laughs> that, that would be the wrong way to go, um, just saying, okay? So there is some correlation in all this between overall happiness and, and uh, how you see your sex life, so it's not unimportant. Um, and the question is sort of when do things start to change in intimacy, all this behavior of kissing and holding hands, et cetera, that's so important. Um, and it really is really important. I, um, I, I noticed the shift, we noticed the shift when we analyzed this. I had two partners on this, one named Christina Northrup and a demographer named Jim Whitty at uh, George Mason University. He was our statistician. Um, that we took a look at um, when does the curve start getting more um, uneven in terms of happiness? Six to nine years. You know, we've all heard about that seven-year itch, and I used to think that was kind of a joke, but it's not, it's not necessarily kind of a joke. It's... It really does seem that things go into jeopardy in that group of at least the couples that are still together. Obviously, as you may know, the, hi the highest divorce rate is in the first three years of marriage, with the first year being the most dangerous. Um, but it still starts to change, even in intact couples, in this period of time. Um, and just basically what we see in all these relationships, happy or unhappy, but least so in the happiest, um, is that if people are older or people have been together for a long time, um, they stop doing some of these good, affectionate behaviors that we think really bring two people together. So you can take a look at, um, while there's still quite a bit of, of passionate kissing going on and people who've been together 25 years or longer, it's declined a whole lot from when they met, where it was almost universal. And it's both by age and by duration of relationship. So there's the arc of it, you know, a lot of people who are not doing that anymore. Still more than half, so it's not like it's disappeared from couples, but it's, it's, um, it literally declines by age and duration. People stop putting perhaps the, the input into each other, um, and they, they let the relationship go on automatic pilot, and it suffers that way. Um, and that phrase, my partner has sex with me out of obligation, um, if they're newlyweds, it's about 12%, so those people aren't going to make it. But nonetheless, it's a low number of people. Um, but it goes to almost half, about half, um, in relationships of 21 years or more. And these are intact couples. 
So they're, they've got some issues. What does the research say is the reason for it? Here's the things you read in the research literature most of the time. Boredom. I mean, you could, the way I sort of say it is, you know, I like steak, but if I had to eat it morning, noon, and night, I'd be looking at vegetables as, you know, sexy. Um, because you, you, you just do the same thing. Uh, for some people, it's, it's great. You know, you, you li know what you do and you like it. But for a lot of people, it's just not as interesting if it's been done the same way all the time. Probably the biggest uh, enemy of sex and intimacy is anger. People who are, you know, a low grade or a high grade of, of anger over something. That, that just, for most people, it cuts down on their sexual energy. Uh, lack of communication. It's not being very effective and nobody has told the other person. This is, I find, this is the stuff that sends people to marital therapists and sex therapists. And then in front of a third person, they finally tell something that needed to be said a long time ago. Lack of romance. People say, you know, I don't want to be treated like a machine. I want to be wooed. I want, I want some of the same kinds of romantic acts that we had in the beginning. And if they're not there, they start to either be disinterested, get angry, or bored. Um, and lack of quality time or attention. Uh, we ask people a lot of times when, if you do make love, when do you make love? If you do find yourself kissing passionately or spontaneously, when do you? And usually it's in sort of the garbage time of the day, you know, sort of like after the late, 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 late show or, um, you know, in, in times that people are kind of exhausted or it's the time that wasn't set aside for anything else. It's not usually when they've set aside the time for each other. Um, if people are older, um, the sex sexuality is still present. Um, yes, it goes down uh, for post people post 50, but not as much as the media would have you believe. Um, it's, um, but there is about no oh, third less third of people who whose sex life becomes highly infrequent. Um, and um, what is an interesting gender difference? is if you have a very infrequent sex life, women basically will say, in our study at least, and in other studies as well, that I know of, well, our sex life isn't very good, but our marriage is good. But there are very few men who say our sex life is good. Excuse me, our, our sex life isn't very good and our marriage is good. That tends to sh um, be much more likely to them feel that the general relationship is affected by that and it's not... Um, uh, put 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 in its own box and not affecting anything else. So okay, so I've been telling you that relationships need more uh, affection and more and more sex. Most of them do, and by affection, you know, I'm not just talking about the PDAs or passionate kissing. That holding hands thing is a really important thing. There's a very interesting series of research on the importance of skin contact. And, um, and in a sense, we know it because, you know, when, if, if someone wanted to hold our hands, a close friend, we think that's nice. If some stranger wants to hold our hand, we don't want to do it, you know? Um, and in fact, we're nervous <laughs> and think they're going to take our purse or our wallet. Um, but it, there was this great study. They took a whole bunch of couples. Let's say you were, couple, you were all coupled here. And there's no reason you sat on that room or that side of the room. Maybe just saw some seats. So there's nothing that distinguish you from each other. And they took the couples, this was done at the University of North Carolina in 2004. They put the couples in two different rooms and they hooked them up with heart monitors and um, they took blood samples to get their cortisol levels to see how, how their stress was. High cortisol levels will show an impact of stress. Um, and then they said, okay, we're gonna ask you to watch a nature film. So everybody all hooked up to these monitors and stuff watches a nature film. They have them sit uh, then facing each other. And then they say, we want you to solve a tough problem in your relationship. And the only difference between the two groups of couples was one couples would just say, just look at each other, don't touch. And the other couples would say, hold hands during it. Only difference. And as you might imagine, because I put it in this, this context in this lecture, the couples that held hands not only had a slower heartbeat, and way lower levels of cortisol, lower stress, but they were more likely to reach a conclusion and a solution for their problem, and they did it in lo less time than the couples who did it at the other side. 
Holding hands is just an amazing connection. Very hard to fight in a nasty way if you're holding hands. Very hard not to be connected and focused on each other. So to me, those kinds of things, as they diminish, are actually quite serious because they're, they're, not, they're the kind of thing anyone can do. There might be medical and other reasons some of this other stuff doesn't happen, but most couples could hold hands if they, if they wanted to and thought about it. The other thing that um, we found that was really important in couples was this predictability and habit issue. Um, if people felt they had innovation in their relationship, they were much more likely to be happy. There's another interesting study that I, I want to throw in here because I think it's so interesting. Uh, this was a study the um, psychology department did, not here, but another university. And they took couples who said they needed some help and they divided them in three groups. They said, you can choose one of these three groups. You could pick which group you wanted to be in. One group had classic therapy. We're going to get you in front of a clinical psychologist and they're going to work with you about your relationship. The second group was, okay, we're going to let you two, we're going to help you to do the things that really make you happy. If you like to travel, we'll let, we're going to help you do that. If you like to cook together, play golf, whatever it is, you'll do that. See if that helps your relationship. The third group, they said, you guys are going to have to do all new things. You know, if you don't skate, you're going to learn how to skate. If you don't play golf, we'll teach you that. If you don't um, uh, climb mountains and they want to do that, we'll help you do that. But whatever it is, it's something you have not done before and you're going to have to do it together. And interestingly enough, the couples in that last situation, not the couples getting therapy, not the couples doing what they like to do, but the couples that had to learn new things together had the highest rate of self-satisfaction with how their personal growth and their happiness as a couple at the end of this six month, three to six month trial. So innovation, doing things together, learning things together, feeling your own personal growth, all that stuff seems to be really, really important. And it makes a big difference in sexual desire and sexual passion. It's interesting when you think of that and in this big thing about Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, you can poo-poo Fifty Shades of Grey, and certainly I want you to know I think they miscast that guy in the movie. I just <laughs> didn't do it for me. But nonetheless, Fifty Shades of Grey is important, at least because it's been a worldwide phenomenon. This book has outsold all the Harry Potter books. There is no book that has sold more than Fifty Shades of Grey. So I don't care if it has bad writing and all the reasons people say they didn't uh, finish it, etc. The fact is that it seemed to fit a niche of sexual fantasy that a lot of women wanted world over. So they may not really want to do everything that was in that book, but it was a fantasy that appealed to them. So we asked on our study, um, would you be interested in kinky sex? Now, we didn't define kinky. For some people, that might be leaving the lights on. You know, I don't know. <laughs> OK? But whatever it was to them, they could say that. And you can see from these numbers, now here's where men were almost universal, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but those are high numbers from women, too. And I often think that it's these new things, then, that um, really, really are interesting to women. In fact, one of the things that I think is interesting is how common um, that, oh, oh, that I really feel bad that this particular, I'm sorry, um, this particular one uh, uh, graph doesn't show. Basically, it's taking a look at, um, it's a graph made out of um, vibrators, <laughs> and it shows that every, in every age group, over 50% of women and couples use them. Um, even the lowest age group is from 18 to, to 21. That's maybe like a little, just around 50%, but between, let's say, 25 and 40, two-thirds. So that's a kind of uh, sexual, you know, imagination or freedom or additive, if you want, that in, you know, 30, 40 years ago simply wouldn't have been um, considered um, or as appropriate for you know, good men and women. Um, what's the danger of not uh, paying attention to sexual lives? Um, it's interesting when you look at what people say they fantasize about. You could see that for one thing, they fantasize a lot. Actually, they fantasize, fan, fans, 
fantasize a lot. Um, but um, men in particular fantasize about their partner's friends. I always say get ugly friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just saying it's a lot safer, really. <laughs> Guys don't have to worry as much as women do, but those are pretty good numbers on the men. Um, but two-thirds of the women and 90% of the men in our study said they fantasize about people they meet. That's okay. That's not a big problem, of course. But this one um, does make me wonder. Uh, half of the men and a third of the women are thinking about someone else while they're making love with their partner. And um, unless you've agreed upon that as one of your kinky things, um, I think it means you want to be a little more connected. Um, there is a lot of possibility for random thoughts for people. We asked people, if you could have an outside partner and it would have absolutely no effect on your relationship, would you do it? Two-thirds of the men and almost half of the women. I'd say you really have to pay attention to each other if there's that kind of sense of, of still imagination and thought about other partners. If we took a look at the very happy couples, the extremely happy couples, <coughs> it was still half of the men, about a quarter of the women. So <coughs> it's just, I think, in our animal, it's not necessarily about happiness. <coughs> and to some extent, it would be good if you lived in a very isolated area. <laughs> We said, well, a lot of people said, well, you know, we, would you be tempted if someone asked? And um, you could see those numbers. Almost half of the women would be tempted and two-thirds of the men. So I think a lot of people are monogamous just because no one thought to ask them not to be. <laughs> and a third of the women said they were tempted by an old friend and a quarter of the men. So I tell guys, really go to that high school reunion with your <laughs> wife, because that's the most common in our study of older people. That was the most common place women were non-monogamous. Just saying. <clears throat> so that more women than men have had a sex with an old frame. All this said, though, one of the things in this very large study that was very, you know, affirming, because it all sounds like, oh, my God, you know, we're all fragile. Not so much. Um, most of the couples in the study said they were happy, at least at the happy level. They may not all have been at the extremely happy, but most of them said they were happy. Two-thirds of these couples said in, the, in our country that they remained extremely, hap extremely attracted to their partner. We could give them different differences of, you know, sort of attracted, attracted, very attracted, extremely attracted, two-thirds, three, excuse me, three-fourths. And it was pretty similar in most countries. I think Italy, there's something to be said about that. I don't know, too much pasta, whatever. Um, <laughs> but still, that's really high in, across the board. I love this one. Three-quarters, we said, if you, could, if you could be free, would you choose your partner again? And three-quarters of people said, yes, they would, which I thought was really wonderful. Seventy percent felt their partner loved them more than in the beginning of their relationship. And 25 percent said as much. So very few people felt that love had, had gone from their relationship. And, and the majority of them felt that it increased. Now, of course, these are all intact couples. These aren't the ones that left. But I like the idea that you know, in couples of various sorts, they were happy to be together. Now, here's one thing I do want you to think about, as we're almost out of time. We asked men and women if they would risk their life to save their partner. 96% of men in a happy relationship said they would risk their part life for their partner. And what was interesting is just a few percent less said, no matter what the relationship felt like, they would risk their life for their partner. I think there's a kind of nobility in this part of men's role, that they feel this is who you are as a man. And as a man, of course, you would risk your life to save your wife, no matter what the relationship was like. So then we asked the women. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So quite a lot of them said they would risk their life for their husband. Not anywhere as close to the guys, but quite a lot in happy relationships. If it was an unhappy relationship, <laughs> so guys, <laughs> work on that marriage. <laughs> You never know. You might have a heart attack. So because these were so low, I did, we did ask, like, why wouldn't you, you know, jump in the water or whatever it was to save him? And there was interesting. There were some actual reasons. One was that um, they had children. You know, they felt like they couldn't risk their child being an orphan. So that was in their brain. Men's brain is just save. Women's brain is, I've got, I've got kids. <laughs> and the second one was they didn't feel strong enough. I mean, no use to both of us dying. <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, what can I say? So I'm going to, because we're, we're close, and I, I, I don't want to say that, um, you know, to, to get into a couple other areas, I would say that one of these things that this study has shown me um, is that there, there are gender differences, of course, but that for most of the people, they, they were in marriages and relationships. We did look at cohabiting couples, too, and um, that they wanted to be in, that they felt attracted to their partner. Um, most of the non-monogamy that was in fantasy and not in practice, it was relatively low. Um, but couples were neglecting those small, affectionate, romantic connectors that they all had almost universally used in the beginning of their relationships. And those little connectors, those no things that you have only with your partner, seem to have real powerful impact for relatively small behaviors. And so for me, I think it's almost... You know, my bottom line of this part of the study was, you know, people attend to each other and be more focused and more cognizant about making their partner feel good about themselves, giving more compliments, giving unexpected gifts, going out for romantic things that they hadn't done before, thinking of innovative things to do, um, trying to be, make this relationship organic and live and growing and not let it slip into so much habit that nobody feels like they're getting the best of each other. I think of relationships as, you know, the, the foundation upon which we live. Sometimes um, we don't all have to be married or in a relationship. We can have extraordinary relationships with our friends and with our children and with our community. But if we have this additional kind of relationship, um, it's a great advantage in the world. And sometimes I think we actually treat our main relationship as less, as more an automatic pilot and less attentive as we do with our good friends. I think we know that our good friends wouldn't hang around if we weren't attending to them and, you know, trying to, to really uh, make sure we use the right language and communicate well, et cetera. And sometimes we think that our, our partnership and our romantic partnership can just continue on in its own fuel and not give it the same kind of attention we do elsewhere. So I suppose the bottom line of this particular piece of research and lecture is to remind us all to put a little more effort and romance back in our major relationships, uh, romantic relationships, and I think you will get way more out of that than you might even imagine you would. You get a lot of bang for this buck. Just little acts go a long way in terms of making intimate relationships that much more profound. Thank you. Thank you.